What is up, people of the internet? Welcome back to another episode, a special episode of the Waveform Podcast. We're your hosts. I'm Marquez. And I'm Adam. Hey, Adam. Hi. You're on this side of the table. Yeah, I'm over here. I graduated finally to the big boy table. Wait, but if you're here, then who's... Then... Oh, hey. Oh, Andrew's at the producer table. It's so weird over here. <laughs> Can you hear yourself? No. No, yeah, we turned down. It's a little different over here. <laughs> But we did, We have a, a bit of a special episode because we thought uh, this would be a really fun thing to sort of pull back the curtain on a little bit. Uh, some conversations that we have around the studio have turned into podcast episodes for the longest time. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also have all kinds of other conversations with other people connected to the studio that are also sometimes really interesting. Yeah. And this is one where we figured, you know what, before we even get into this, let's just record it just to have it. And it turned out to be one of those really good, fun conversations that's actually worth sharing. Yeah, like a lot of times for videos, which you guys listening or watching don't get to see, is we talk with the people that make the products a lot, trying to better understand the products. And those conversations typically never see the light of day. They're usually secret or Usually briefed. secret or, yeah, like it's just like behind the scenes kind of thing. You have a quick question, hop on a call with someone. Yeah. So I'm doing a video for Studio Channel, and for that, I reached out to some company, and I was like, hey, I'm doing this video. I would like to maybe speak to the person who was in charge of making these certain decisions that I want to know why they made those decisions. And they were like, sure, yeah, just talk to this guy. This guy ended up being the co-founder of the company. So last second, David and I were like slacking each other that morning, and we're like, hmm, maybe we make this into an episode, and we can just like turn this into a thing where these conversations we have with people behind the scenes can just be brought more to the foreground so people can kind of see how this stuff comes together. Yeah. So this episode is with David Erickson, the co-founder of Teenage Engineering. Teenage Engineering is a company that makes a lot of my favorite gadgets, like the OP1, the OPZ, they're like music synthesizers. This but is what they, they've done most Yeah, that's what they're the most years. known for. But they've been in the headlines a lot more frequently lately for some other collaborations. You might recognize them from a lot of other places. Yeah. Like nothing, like the new Rabbit device that came out, they were the ones designing it. Uh, the play date, if you guys remember that, like a year or two ago, it was like a little Game Boy-esque thing. Like they designed it. Mm -hmm. So we just thought we'd play the play the interview and here you go. This is it. Uh, can you say your full name and what exactly you do at Teenage Engineering? Okay, my full name is David Erickson. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I was part of founding Teenage with my dear friends and uh, my title here is Head of Hardware. Head of Hardware. And hardware for us is basically, you know, the platforms that's inside the machines, electronics and yeah, and around. That sounds complicated. Yeah. <laughs> so you guys have a ton of different products. So little backstory how this meeting came to be was I reached out asking to speak with someone about the EP133, the new sampler you guys released. And then you're the guy they put me in contact with. So you headed that product and that project? Yes. And do you um, head all of the projects? Parts in all projects, mm -hmm. as in on the technology side. If you look at our portfolio, uh, they are very different. I mean, we have from furniture to advanced mm -hmm. digital mixers. Uh, for everything that's, that has electronics inside, we try and at least build them in a way so they work together. I mean, it could be simple stuff like making sure that they all have a Bluetooth LE uh, chip inside so we can send, mm. you know, MIDI data or sync signals between like a mixer and the synth and something else. Or it could be that the fact that the USB C's on, on most of our high range products are dual roles. So you can actually take two synths and connect them with a the cable. You don't need to go to a computer and back. Mm. So I would say my role is partly to ensure that that happens. So, uh, it, I mean, to, to us, it's not like we're trying to build like an ecosystem that's close to just TE devices. It's more that trying to avoid the need for for a host computer in a, in a setup. I mean, yeah. part of the name of the field series uh, that, that we have, everything works standalone, but you can use them together. Uh, um, and then usually the way we work here is that some product, I mean, we usually try and keep the teams very, very small. So, so it, we have products that's been made out of basically a formation of two people, like a software 
engineer and the and the EE uh, or ME plus you know combination of view. Then of course you pick them pick some components from from previous projects, whether it's like a physical component, like a knob, or it could be you know a chipset or a stack of code. Mm. Um, but then, then in terms of how the machine works, there's usually one person that is like a product owner or lead for that. And that can be an ME, an ID person, a software person. Uh, and for the for our most recent device is uh, KO2. Uh, I, I did that because it was um, maybe you read online, but it, w- it was kind of a project we'd never planned to do. Mm-hmm. We talked, of course, about making it upscaled pocket operator uh, with real keys and a real ch- case. But we started it in the summertime when we were both on vacation, me and uh, one of our lead MEs, mechanical engineers. Mm-hmm. So uh, we at that point in time, we didn't really know what the product would do. But I've always been into like just the vintage samplers a lot. Mm-hmm. And we never really done that except for the KO1. Um, so, so it was kind of, okay, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll manage this project. It's, it's very, you know, we don't really have, you know, structure in that sense. Yeah. So it made sense that I would do it. Uh, and then of course we, if we've been a couple of software engineers and MEs and, you know, in the beginning we were like two, three people in the, in the, you know, crunch of the project, we were maybe 10 momentarily mm-hmm. and then we scale back. Wow, uh, that's not that's a, a lot of how people. We work. It's, it's very different, but it, it's still, it's, it's important that the core group kind of has a passion for, for the product. And, and so that's why, but of course, we still try and make them so, that, so it, they have some elements that are recognizable from other TE devices. Yeah. Yeah. Like how much of this was you guys pulling things from like the pocket operators and how much of it was a brand new problem that you guys had to solve? Like, is there a particular story you have in mind? where it was something unique to the KO2 that you guys had to figure out? I mean, the old KO is roughly, uh, let me think, a third in processing power. And and of course, it didn't have any like built-in flash storage, or it had a little bit, but not, not 64 megabytes. Mm-hmm. So like comparing the two, 64 megabytes is a lot. Comparing 64 megabytes with some other things on, on that's out there now, of course, you can get gigabytes if you want, but we felt that it was important to have this kind of quite, you know, limited feature set as in uh, no menu diving, uh, not too much storage because you, you kind of get stressed out of, you know, having 30 versions of your latest song and you, and here's like, no, make, make a new song, you know, bounce it or track it down to tape or into your door or whatever. So, uh, but it also has to do with cost, of course, because if you throw a big CPU in there and a lot of memory, it's going to be maybe a couple of hundred dollars more retail. Uh, and battery, of course, uh, as soon as you hit the threshold, I mean, the pocket operators are like extremely power efficient. You can have two AAAs and it can be on for a year. And when you hit play, it starts instantly and it still yep. runs. That's what mine does. Uh, it just sits there until I hit play and then it just starts doing yeah. things. <laughs> uh, here we have a real power button actually. So it's, <laughs> we actually cut the power physically when you turn it off. Oh, wow. uh, but it's also a very power efficient, you know, CPU or MCU, whatever you mm-hmm. want to call it. Yeah. Um, so it was important for us not to throw in like a charge your IC and a lithium battery. So it's, it's again like AAA in the EP and P- PO series. You run off AAA batteries, mm-hmm. classic vintage yeah. technology. It's going to be around, I think, for, for many, many years. Whereas mm-hmm. if, as soon as you put a custom made cell like you have in your phones, eventually that will dry out and mm. you have to rely on, you know, an experienced service yeah. technician to, to swap it out. Yeah. So like to that point, there's, I don't know how true this is because I feel like I've only heard it once or twice from random like YouTube videos and stuff, but I had heard that you guys had decided to like basically buy a bunch of like inexpensive components and you pull it all in a pile in front of you and then try to figure out what can you make with this? Is that kind of how the 
EP-133 came to be? <laughs> yeah, partly true. The way that they made this product, to my understanding, is after the pandemic, they were like, okay, there's obviously not a lot of chips and things that people can buy. Remember, there was a chip shortage, that whole thing. Mm -hmm. So they went and looked at all of these different companies that were making chipsets and tried to find substitutes for what they were already using. And after gathering a bunch of those things and making like signing those contracts, whatever, then they sat down, they were like, okay, now we can make this thing. And they like kind of designed it as they went along, hmm. which was interesting to me. And I was just wondering like, one, have you ever heard of something like this before? <laughs> no. <laughs> like I've heard of like companies using their old stock. Like we make that joke about iPads all the time. Like, oh, they just parts have- Parts bin. Yeah, parts bin. They yeah. threw an iPad together. But like how many more cool gadgets could we have if everyone just took like the lowest common denominator from all these different like sources it would and be put really, something together? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I do feel like, you know, they're known for their designs. So I feel like in order to make something that is super uniquely designed, you do have to have a somewhat unique process. And I I guess this could only these types of products could only come from a company that has a unique process. Like That's you would true. never get something as intricately or interestingly put together or thought out if you just did it the same way everyone else did. Yeah. I don't know if that's exactly how they did it. If so, that's <laughs> crazy and super cool. But yeah, you do have to have something special. There. Yeah, I found that pretty cool. We spent a lot of time around 2000. Well, I was just about to say 11, 20, 2021. <laughs> okay, I was like, wow. <laughs> uh, 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 just finding substitutes of components in our existing portfolio. So it's mm. like really, you know, tiresome work. Um, and at the same time, lead times to get something new. It could be a a, a chipset, whether it's a power IC or a flash memory or MCU, you know, it was like lead times ranging from 64 to 99 weeks. So it was like out of the question to pick anything like that. So we basically what I did is that we have a lot of connections on the chip vendors. So we just called every vendor, like, you know, our favorites to random, you know, less known brands that makes MCUs. And we just have the same questions. Do you have, you know, this amount of chips in stock that we can get now or, you know, a couple of months from now? And most didn't. So we had to, and eventually, you know, one company called back and we worked with them before, uh, Cypress. Now that they're acquired by Infineon in, in Germany. And they were like, oh yeah, we, we actually have a, a pile now uh, of MCUs. Do you need them? Uh, so we we like okay, uh, it has kind of the specs we need: low power, 150 megahertz. It's a dual core CPU, but we we actually don't use the other core yet. <laughs> uh, and then so we committed to use that, and then then we started ordering. So as we went designing the schematic, we we basically looked at distributors or even DigiKey. It's like, do they have enough stock? It's like yes, okay. You buy it first, you know. Enter your credit card, order, <laughs> and then you add it to the schematic. Uh, so, okay. so, of course, that you know, once we got into like board bring up and verifying the system, there was some mistakes. So we, we of course, ended up with some excess parts. You know that you have to kind of find a good use of or sell. Uh, but it was mm -hmm. really fun to work like that. Usually, you, I mean, just five years ago, you could design the whole board, you buy all the components, like in you know quantities of ten or twenty, and then somewhere around the finish line, you you place the orders some months later you can start to produce but now it's like then you would have to wait a year or two from you know design freeze to so it was both i mean it was a good good kind of way of working and and at the same time we set a lot of you know rules we we knew from start we really wanted it to be not a cent over 300 dollars retail why that number specifically um i mean we started 100 lower but it was completely <laughs> unrealistic no it's just like a balance of i mean we we have a lot of products that's in the high range mm -hmm. like both feature wise um and i mean it it's just there's so much stuff in in our other field products that you know they become quite expensive 
So we said that it's it's more important that it's an affordable machine that anyone will buy rather than just an experienced musician or like yeah. a, you know, it's, it's kind of this, uh, we joked about it being like the Nerf gun of, of synthesizers, you know, just, just the way the plastic is built up really like, it's good quality plastics, but it's still, it's, 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 it's kind of intended to not look too fancy, but not too cheap. It's, mm -hmm. uh, was that always the design from the start? Did you guys always have like a dope ass calculator in mind or <laughs> did it just come to uh, be as you were making it? It changed quite a bit along the way, but we, it was always kind of the, f the form factor was pretty much defined. Mm -hmm. uh, we, I think we moved things around a little bit and, and you know, the way we did this kind of back printed, uh, I don't know what we call it on our website, but it's <laughs> it's just LEDs tuning up between behind like colored, mm -hmm. uh, like a screen printed film, it's like a light diffuser with a, uh, and then we made a little custom three segment display with a funky typeface. Mm -hmm. uh, we could have used an LCD, but again, as soon as you do, it's you kind of it opens up for menus and you know, hierarchies. So it's, yeah. it was kind of nice not having that option. And honestly, neither on the EP 133 or the KO2 or the pocket operators, you don't really need the screen. You don't, it's fun at start and you can see the tempo, mm -hmm. but, but once you get over like, a, you know, it's more into kind of muscle memory. You don't really need to look at the screen. Mm -hmm. Th that's a good point. Uh, one thing too, that I feel like is very, obvious in something like the pocket operator or even the knockout two is I feel like you guys in general tend to like define a limitation and then work your way in and figure out what you can make in that space. Um, is that something that's intentional or for something like this, were you trying to keep it under a certain price? So that was the limitation or was it always more like a functionality limitation? I mean, I think, Normally, we wouldn't look at the price point when we do a product. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's rare, but it's important. Sometimes it's also like we knew we wanted to do it in one year. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically finish it and then ramp production, which takes another set of months. Uh, in one uh, year? You guys are crazy. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was quite quick. So in, we started in August 2022. It was, we started soft ramping production in August, 2023. Mm. Um, and then, then we had to, it's always slow at start. I mean, it's not like you just call a number and they just replicate it for you. Yeah. We, we manage the production lines in a way that we, we design it. We, we, we build the fixtures and the equipment needed. And of course, when you do a new product <clears throat> that breaks, so some some days we could just make, you know, 20 units on a full day and, mm. and a good day we could do a couple of hundreds. Yeah. Just very, like, so we, we actually produce in, in Europe, in Spain. And that was also part of this trip that we, we were all like, let's make this in Europe. So we started in like Sweden where we are located. Mm -hmm. It's, there's not many factories in that sense because we used to have like, you know, Ericsson and Sony Ericsson making phones here back in the day, but those factories are gone. So mm -hmm. we had to look, you know, from Eastern Europe, we went to like Estonia, Latvia, Poland, Czech Republic, oh, wow. Italy, France. We did 14 different, you know, contract manufacturers that, that we, you know, we made kind of an Excel sheet and, <laughs> and, and we looked at everything from like, uh, you know, the people, you know, do, uh, the environment, do they have good, like it backend machines, mm -hmm. you know, could we shake Did the CTO or CEO come to us and shake hands, you know, yeah. it's also like a plus, you know, do they care or not that, that <laughs> kind of parameter, uh, um, and you know, door to door, you know, for, for us, it's like a three and a half, uh, half hour flight, and then 20 minutes by car to where we ended up. Mm. So it's, it's very convenient. Yeah. Of course, uh, being able to drive there would have been even better, but I think we, we found a good balance. It's kind, kind of a very tech driven contract manufacturer. 
but they mm. only do circuit boards as a profession. So okay. This is probably the first box build that they've, they've done. Interesting. Me meaning like a consumer co yeah. co product. So we have to kind of train them how to do it. Um, that, that, that's also part of this ramp up process. It's, it's, probably the equal amount of hours spent on building the production line as building the synth. Mm -hmm. And how many, more. how many prototypes did you guys go through? Is there like a number in your uh, head? Circuit or? boards. I think we ship with revision five or six. Okay. Meaning, uh, that's, that's just schematic changes. <laughs> no, not bad. It was, uh, <laughs> we had, yeah. Um, I don't remember what we changed, but it, it's usually power related or, you know, mm. stupid mistakes and stuff like that. And then plastics, we, I think, I don't remember exactly. I think we, we went quite fast into what you call hard tooling, where you pay a lot of money to tool parts mm. because it's a lot of plastic parts. Um, just a few iterations. To hit like the tolerances we need and then then on top of that you, you iterate like colors and finishes and get the texturing right and yeah. all of that stuff um, um but yeah not not too many honestly we I, I guess we were a little bit lucky but what took the most time again is is, is to putting it together like mm. just getting uh getting all of that like because we care still even if it's just just 300 dollars retail we don't it we care a lot about the cosmetics mm -hmm. and that's the hard part when when you move it around on, on the production line it's easy that you you know it gets scratched up or true um, so we build a lot of like what do you say call it in in in, in english uh, like cradle sense and and linear kind of uh, actuators to plug in the usb so it's not a human like trying to to oh, okay. plug yeah. in the type c because then they're gonna scratch like the back of it mm -hmm. so it's actually a little Moving oh wow! Interesting. Arm, just to to make sure <laughs> to minimize all the risks, uh, but it, I think yeah. Obviously, we 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 did a lot of that work, but you heard about the failure problems we ended up mm -hmm. with in, the, in the, at launch. Yeah, Even has that been a, a headache for you? Or <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's you kind of you don't remember previous projects, but it's always something like that. Yeah. I think on some early. I mean, we have we have always had some problems. Like mm -hmm. it's even if you try and predict everything that can potentially go wrong, both in in the factory side or or shipping, you know, there's there's always something. So, quick backstory there. Okay, Fader Gate is this thing about this particular product, okay. and it comes with a small fader on the left side of the device that when people were first getting their initial orders, they were finding that it was broken or wasn't working, or you have to kind of like put it together yourself a little. So there's little knobs that you have to push on to the little fader and people were doing that too hard and breaking it or it was getting messed up in shipping. So it turned into like this whole thing where now if you order one, it comes with like a little plastic hard piece on top to stop it from getting crushed in the packaging during shipping. Sure. But a couple things, one, that reminded me of all the different gates that we've experienced over the years. Plenty of <laughs> gates. Plenty. Do you know what's impressive too is he brought it up. Yeah. I, I'm just like trying to think like if we talk to any other like person yeah. at a company, they would just never talk about anything like that. Mm -hmm. And if you ask them questions, it would be like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had that question a little bit further down the list and he just brought it up himself. Yeah. And like this wasn't like I'm not. I'm not doing any like journalism here. I wasn't trying to like press him for hard questions or anything, but he just like, I was just doing background information and he kind of brought it up himself, which I found really interesting. Yeah. Um, but also the other thing that really caught me off guard was he said they shipped this on the fifth or sixth iteration. Do you remember how many iterations we went through for the shoe? Yeah. For the sneaker? <laughs> Plenty more than five or six. More than five or six. And that's a sneaker, huh. like no digital components, no like small little knobs and things. It was To be crazy. fair, I've never designed a shoe before, so of course it took me a lot of revisions. <laughs> Maybe he's just that uh, dialed in to the type True. of hardware that they're working on. Yeah, what if we just got a bunch of pieces of other old shoes and then asked you to make a shoe? Right, yeah. That's basically what they did. Huh. So I found it pretty interesting. Yeah. But, process. Yeah. I also feel like I'm getting a look into the the 
the way the gears are turning in his mm-hmm. head. Like you can see him like remembering things that are like organically coming up as you ask yeah. me questions, which is that's fun. Yeah, that's it's fun. always fun to talk to people that like are hands on with their products. Like this guy actually was the lead. Like he's a co-founder, but he's the lead of this product just because of the way that the company is set up. So it's really cool. interesting. All right, well, we're going to take a quick break, but after it, we'll be right back with more from David Erickson. All right, now that we paid some bills, let's jump back in. Anything that sticks up will eventually break if you drop it. But in our case, it was, you know, we were quite optimistic with the packaging and the way <laughs> the, the actual, you know, shaft or the fader was sort of... So, Basically, you could just take a hammer and hit it like, and and it will break. But now we have a mm. little spacer in the packaging. Yeah, mine came uh, with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but partly also we we try to move away, like many other companies, from like using plastics or foam stuff mm-hmm. like that, that that makes it easy to protect protect the device. So as soon as you go with just cardboard and and like molded paper pulp. You know, it's it's just going to be more sensitive. Yeah, uh, but uh, but it's all good now. I think uh, mm-hmm. it was just the first first batch. Yeah, um, and yeah, and that's what ends up on the early reviews. But <laughs> yeah. it's, it's all good. I hope people understand. I was not expecting you personally to have taken such a big role in all of this, <laughs> considering like your role at the company. Um, is that how every project gets worked on over there? Like the someone, like you said earlier, someone takes ownership, but let's say there's only what, how many employees do you guys have? Like a hundred maybe? <laughs> uh, well, not, not really, but may, I think we're 60 to 65. So like one uh, or two people will just take ownership of something and see that from start to finish. Yeah. It's easy. It's like that. We don't have like a PM project manager for mm-hmm. all projects or it's more like on the, let's say out of the. 65, let's say, that works here. Mm-hmm. Half of it we call R&D, meaning we actually group every discipline that goes into making the product under R&D. So industrial design, mechanical engineering, electronic engineering, software, as well as like, you know, designing the operating system, the foundation, more support packages, the back end. We have a lot of server, you know, mm systems obviously f- to run the production lines uh, to run the you know our website but we do everything in-house that's always been important to us we don't mm-hmm. really we don't go to a company that builds factories or builds factory test equipment we yeah i guess it's 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 both when we start not knowing that of course you can buy it but it's always either too expensive or too slow so you end up building those primitives yourself and then you know uh, eventually you, you have a quite good uh, system uh, mm. that you can make use of in, in, in new products so we can have a junior team do a product based on you know experiences from previous things and uh, but yeah we we, tr- we try and uh, it's hard to but yeah but back to, to, to the headcount I if you, if you then divide by the disciplines, we're very few. I, mm-hmm. I think we're like four EEs in total, five ME. Like, wow. uh, so so to do everything that we do, including the factories, we <laughs> we jump around a lot, yeah. like different projects. So it's 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 getting this. Uh, so I mean, for the EP, I mean, all the factory sounds, like the, the content that it comes in. Of course, that's managed by. I mean, in this case, it was managed by me. Usually, the product owner does that too. So going to studios, recording. Mm-hmm. We work with a lot of producers and sound designers ar- around the globe, mm-hmm. but that's that's also the same. We don't have a sound person to do that or yeah. a content team. That's it's, kind of what I'm getting at. It's like it's weird that this was you personally doing all yeah, this. Yeah, one day you draw schematics, the other day you build like some sort of like factory test equipment, the third day you you, you edit you know drum sounds in in Logic and yeah, and then you know we all do a little bit of coding to build like pipelines and tools to to make life easier and but it's it's it's, it's fun like that uh, i think it's as soon as you start to build a hierarchical dev environment mm-hmm. you're just going to slow down so it's mm. like mm. interesting okay so then 
One thing that someone asked me the other day on Twitter or threads or something like that, that I couldn't quite pin down is someone was asking, what is the overall design? Like, what's the name for the design of teenage engineering products? What do you consider it? Because it's very unique. It's very playful, I guess, but it's not really like, I don't know. It looks like nothing else. I answered, I said kind of minimal and like retro future, but I don't even know if that's accurate. Like as someone inside the company, as one of the co-founders, what would you call it? Um, I mean, I mean, first of all, I think, I mean, we don't, since we're not only doing musical instruments, I mean, we, we, we try and be much, you know, we yeah, just, you're like a design uh, firm almost at this point. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in, in the past, the way we found, I mean, when we started with teenage and built the first product, OP1, we, we kind of, we did under, you know, stealth mode type consulting for other companies mm -hmm. to kind of bring in money to pay the bills for the OP1 <laughs> development. Uh, so it, you, we've been doing a lot of stuff that in the past that people haven't seen from like software engineering to hardware to ID work. Um, but I think we're just maybe, maybe other companies won't agree, but I think we have spent a, a lot of more time and, and effort on the design. I mean, from how it looks to the detailed work, like, I mean, I think in a bigger organization, there would be a fixed, you know, amount of money in the, in the budget. So you have to like ship the product here. Don't, don't work on the, on the finish of, of this plastic or the aluminum parts, uh, you know, any longer because mm -hmm. it, it w you know, it doesn't make sense from, from a business standpoint, but since we're not, <laughs> we, we, uh, how to say we, I think we're more in it for, 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 you know, it's passion driven. So we don't, of course, we have a little feel for what might sell and how to pay pay our employees a salary every month. But <laughs> it's we sometimes we spend an um, pro, um, how do you pronounce it unproportional okay. amount of hours on something that might sell, you know, in the thousands. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think it's it's a combination of you know we have a extremely skilled industrial design boss, which is also co-founder with me, Jesper. Mm. Uh, yes, like, you know, really good at not only the ID part, but also the product feature set down to, you know, the graphics. So we, we, we don't, I, I think in many companies, there is an ID team, there is a UX team, there is a UI team. And then there's a the product team and they try and figure out how to make the product. I mean, we, we all have like studios at home trying mm. to figure out how to build the optimal, you know, studio. <laughs> so, so we, we know so many, you know, uh, products inside out and, and the limitations of current equipment on the market. So we don't really, as we design, we kind of come up with the, with the ideas of how it should look like or. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes it's driven by a form factor or a size. I mean, the field mini devices are very, very small. I mean, t to the point where it's almost hard to, to, you know, turn the knobs on the mixer. Mm. So, so, so then it could be equal amounts of just, you know, we still want to do the small, the world's smallest portable 12 channel digital mixer, Yeah, uh, you know, that fits in your pocket. So it could be that that's the driving factor combined with, you know, there's oh, nothing like it on the market. So it, I think it's just driven by the, the feature sets and the technologies that's out there combined with just mm -hmm. a, a good, good design. I for design. Uh, yeah. Key. I mean, even the product manuals for the EP133 are gorgeous. Like the website looks crazy. And that also, that actually reminds me the EP133 looks a little like the product manuals look different than the other ones. Is yeah. that? The, is that going to be like the new thing going forward or was that specific just for this? I think we were maybe, I mean, the initial manuals that we did like for the OP1 back in the day, they were very, very ambitious to the point where it gets very complicated. You had to be like a 
very skilled uh, graphic designer, typographist, and to even update and add a <laughs> chapter for a new feature. So, mm. of course, eventually you move away to make it more, you know, make the workflow easier to, to tweak the manuals over time. But we now we're kind of dying that back. So, so for the field series, it comes with a thick booklet. That's it's 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 a lot of work to do those because every mm. page is like unique and there's a lot of illustrations in there. And the same with the EP where we try and do it more like online. So there's you know we have this online sample tool to move things in and out from the synth, mm. and we, it, we keep it a little bit more playful and and, and graphical. So the idea was try and communicate in a way that it works for a, you know someone that never owned a synth. Mm. So we don't talk in terms as, you know, we try and avoid like lingo, you know, synthesizer lingo. It's more like, this is how you record a, a sample. And then it has a footnote saying like a sample is a piece of audio that mm. you can, you know, uh, it takes, but it, yeah, we, it's actually a big team working on the manual. I mean, <laughs> from, you know, just drawing, it might be me drawing on paper or it's one of our, uh, Sales guys, that's been he, he drew, drew drew with uh, what do you call it? aquarel, uh, like with you know oh like a yeah like acrylic water paint. paint yeah yeah so he did a lot of like all the waveforms you know he he drafted like oh wow with, that's cool with, 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 uh, and then our graphic design team took that and made it into vector graphics and so it, it's yeah again uh, why why. <laughs> Why spend that time on the manual? But it, I think it's important because sometimes you, I get a little bit turned off when I go to, to a user manual for a product and it just looks terrible. I don't mm. feel like reading it. Yeah. I think when you go to the manual, maybe that's the first thing you do prior to buying the product. So this is like, at least when I was a kid, I was like checking the user manuals for like mm -hmm. old Roland gear and I was like, <laughs> oh man. So I knew the product before I even, you know, had the money to buy it because mm. I read the money 10 times. Yeah, that's, exactly. that's kind of the intention to. Interesting. To, yeah. Okay. So then this also on the box, cause I'm looking at mine here, it says EP series. Are there going to be more of these? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I think, yeah, of course uh, we want to do more. Mm. Um, there's no stress, but yeah, it's, I mean, the EP format is the 10 inch mm. packaging. And I think the form factor, that's kind of where we reuse because we have a few dimensions that we stick to. I mean, the Field Mini has the, you know, the little oh, yeah. uh, cigarette pack shape and then... The microphone too. Marquez has one. I'm very jealous. So you use the microphone mm. in your most recent, well, not most recent now at this point, but in one of your recent videos. Yeah. How did you like it? like first impressions like not a full review but like yeah you've had it for what a month now two yeah months? it's honestly it's very convenient mm -hmm. so i don't have it on a stand i was holding it in my hands yeah and you can still hear some handling noise and i should probably like get a stand and put it <laughs> on a stand but i found it very convenient that it's plug and play there's an on switch it's got a decent enough pop filter built in and it mm -hmm. sounds good from various distances and angles and i just just from those fundamentals, I like it. Yeah. So yeah, it was much better than the last time I tried that, which I was holding a blue Yeti. So oh, okay. didn't didn't feel as good. Yeah, but a blue Yeti is also like ninety bucks or something. Yeah, <laughs> but it's a heavy microphone. That's true. Yeah. All right, so that's been it so far. We'll be back with David Erickson for the rest of the interview, but let's throw it to a quick break. Okay, now let's jump back into the interview. I don't think it's going to be like the pocket operators where they look exactly the same but have mm. different, you know, displays. It's it's more that uh, without saying too much, it's going to be different. Mm. It's not than the KO two. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, nice it's tease there. <laughs> in the periphery and and more. Um, but it's good to find a form factory. It's also fun now when you can. Okay, well, what else can we build? Mm -hmm. um, but we can't add stuff. We can't change the dimensions. They have to s kind of be the same. Of course, we can move things around, you know, mm -hmm. change the knobs to buttons and vice versa. And But yeah, you'll have to wait and see. And But yeah, we, we see a long, you know, uh, I think the pocket operators has been out for nine years. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> OP1 is something like 12, 13 years. 
So it's uh, so EP series might be at least five, if not more. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> um, okay, so then the last question I had was about like updates and firmwares. You guys are already updating and supporting the 133 with like yeah. new new things. How does that come out of like your workday specifically? Like as someone that is also, I'm assuming, juggling other things and even collaborations, like you guys are working with nothing, you're working with Rabbit, like there's all kinds of other projects happening. How do you yeah. plan to support these things in the long term? I mean, we use the machines ourselves. Uh, so we, <laughs> the and we have a lot of musicians and, 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 and you know, beat makers in the building that's that's finding bugs and requesting features and then we have our, our kind of close group beta team that we always collaborate with they, they get all our products early on and so we, we have a pretty good ongoing discussion and then actually i i don't know if it's good or bad but sometimes i get you know a couple of hours of saturday night after you know kids went to sleep where i join the forums uh, and, oh, you know, no. hard forums, <laughs> other forums. You know, it's that's kind of dangerous, man. That's dangerous. At all. That's like yeah, making the comments on a YouTube video. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I go in and it's like, should I? Yeah, I'm, uh, well. Uh. <laughs> so real quick, yeah. How often do you guys just like jump in the comments of YouTube videos, and not like the recent ones? I know you're in there like immediately after it's published. You're yeah. in there like for the yeah. next like two hours or whatever, but like six months ago and just like read your comments oh um i actually do i kind of have my methods with sorting through comments because i've read so many mm -hmm. that i know where to sort of find good comments honestly sometimes i'll go to an old video and instead of looking at the top comments i'll look at the most recent comments because mm -hmm. those are people who are kind of just like showing up organically from a recommendation or something that yeah. just found it and I'll also, spoiler, some of my favorite comments are not on YouTube. They're from other sites that have their own comment sections that have embedded it. So like uh, a subreddit, for example, mm. will have a video that I've made. And the comments from the subreddit will be often way more informative and a little more zoomed out than just like the first 24 hours of people like, ah, oh, I'm first, uh, here's some spam. Interesting. So I, I found it fun to read comments from people who I know have never seen one of the videos before. Yeah, Andrew? I read way too many, <laughs> too many. If it's my video, like the keyboard one or the yeah. outdoor tech, probably like for the first month, I'll probably read every single comment. Every comment? Yeah, yeah. It, it gets to the point <laughs> sometimes many. with pod releasing where on Friday night we're watching TV and Claire won't hear me talk for a few minutes or like 20 minutes and be like, put the phone, put your phone down. You shouldn't be reading these. It's Friday night. Like it's time to relax. So yeah. I read too many, maybe not for my own sake sometimes. Perfect. But, uh, so if you have anything you really want Andrew to know, he's just told me, nice, he's just please looking please at the read it. I need, I need nice, nice comments. No mean ones. But yeah, there's been some good forums actually where sometimes we're just like lurking around to see what's out there. But sometimes I, you know, I actually, it's same with other product owners here for some some of our other sins. If you feel that someone is actually both providing feedback on like this could have been you know done differently, I mean a lot of people is is missing out on a way to sample without holding your finger down because sometimes mm -hmm. you want to like move away to piano and you people are solving that by putting like a weight on a key or something. Yeah, like that. Bo Beats did of that. Course, he had a little like, camera battery. <laughs> yeah, we know that uh, and. But but it's good to join that discussion on the forum. Sometimes you know I I might just reply and say like yep we know we're gonna do it, and we have I mean up until this stage it's just production and stability to get like just to hire uh, you know we, we, it's always some glitches with like power and and stuff that we had to iron out. So we build a lot of what we call like automated automated test. It, monkeys uh, so we have EPs in our server rack uh, so m one might just sample you know on and off 24 7 and we have like a thing that cuts the power in the middle of a sample the other one is just doing patterns like really long ones stuff that would take hours to do manually I think the th third one is just like randomizing key strokes and just you know try to to make it break I would love to see we, that 
yeah. and then eventually we get reports like oh uh, and then you but when when you can run for a couple of you know hours or days straight you you kind of get more and more confident that it's actually robust and stable mm. but then of course there's always a user out there that managed to you know break things anyway uh, but then we usually contact them directly and try and like get the unit back or get the rep row. How did you do it? And mm. but uh, so I think that's the first step for our new products. And and now we're at the position where we can start looking at what is like the second big release. I mean, of course, we have millions of ideas what we can do. Mm-hmm. Uh, but of course, it's a limited. We don't want to have too much, you know shift combos to to enter these new features you have to be doable on the shift on command the, p7 yeah. and then <laughs> resample. i think uh, good good uh youtuber and a friend of ours ricky Tinas, he, he has a lot of synth stuff but he, mm-hmm. he had a fun uh comment in you know if you if you do everything kind of like the the user base ask you to it it becomes like the Homer Simpson's car. There's like an, an episode where Homer designed a car, and and uh, I I think it's quite and it's same for us internally. It's not like I mean users us- are usually right, but it's it's more that at some point you just have to look at what when 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 does this thing became become too complicated to use mm. because you just keep adding and adding. And then it's better to do another machine that solves that problem. Like, mm. uh, but long answer to your question but yes we do support all our products uh as much as we can um uh for the for the ko2 we're just about to launch a new version of the of the sample tool because right now you can pull samples on and off mm-hmm. but we was added a feature to back up your projects and restore and also restore the factory content because some people accidentally erase every factory yeah. sample so um, now we have a little it's not out yet but in a couple of weeks or days yeah. more day, days than weeks uh, because then you can suddenly perform live and then you know next night you know you have to restore it you can you can mess with it without yeah. worrying basically interesting okay so you guys are definitely listening to feedback because that's been like a couple of the things that i've been seeing everywhere people asking for yeah. like, no, I think we do. It's just that we, we decided not to have our own forum because we want to have the kind of direct... I mean, people can email us mm-hmm. uh, directly. Uh, so that's the way in. Um, okay, so I'll put your email on the screen right here. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, no reply at... Uh, <laughs> no, but, <laughs> we, uh, but we definitely see what people online i mean we have some favorite youtubers that that's been doing early reviews and they've done follow-up reviews recently mm-hmm. and just just looking at those i mean we send them you know around internally we kind of have a pretty good view of kind of what needs to happen with that specific product mm-hmm. um, but it's fun it's it's just that at the same time you have to juggle your you know you have to you know what's next in the EP series? We have to we have to do that too. Uh, mm. it's, uh, yeah, it sounds like a lot of trying to like keep one foot here, but always looking ahead, one foot in the, out the door, ready for the next thing. Yeah, a lot of and then of course we talk with the uh, with uh, this, the door makers like you know Ableton and and, mm. and you know around uh, down to like audio editor software that to make sure that whatever file formats we we have. We want, of course, their software to support. Mm. Because, for instance, on TP7 recorder that we do, we make use of multi track WAV files, which is quite rare because usually it's like multiple files and a proprietary file to tell you how your multi track structure looks like. Mm-hmm. And Ableton has one, Logic has another. But we, we kind of usually go to the standards and see it's like, oh, 1984, some guy made a spec for multi-channel wave. Well, why not use that? And then, uh, <laughs> and then you have to convince you know the other software companies to 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 be able to import that. Mm. Some already support it, some don't. Uh, I think that's better to kind of keep an open standard. You know, eventually people might do. You know, there's already some iPhone apps and stuff for our mm-hmm. product. So, oh, interesting. Um, same with the backup tools. It's not really a secret. We don't have documentation, but. You can figure out how, how it works. Yeah. So hopefully someone will build a, 
Um, um, we actually import sustain loops from wave files and root node information from from you know standard wave files mm-hmm. already today. But there's no feature on the EP itself to, to make use of it, but it's prepared. So it's yeah. one day we might have like a loop mode, <laughs> sample mode. <laughs> just, just push it out. Just when people yeah. start <laughs> waiting for it. So that was it. Thanks for David Erickson for taking the time to speak with me. Uh, look out on the studio channel for video coming soon on the EP 133. That's what this whole thing was about. But yeah, it was refreshing to talk to someone that was actually a product guy and not like a PR person. I like product people. Yeah, product people I are was, cool. There's, we talk to people all the time. Sometimes they're in like the PR world and that's a certain type of answer mm-hmm. to a question. Then they're in the product world and I like that one yeah. much better. When it's like the actual person that was designing the thing, they're yeah. like way more passionate about it and you can tell. No offense, PR people. Oh yeah, PR people are lovely, but yeah, product people are great. <laughs> Until the next one, though, we'll get back to our regularly scheduled programming. But let us know if you want to see more stuff like this in the future. As you know, we read comments. Catch you in the next one. Peace. This episode of Waveform was produced by Adam Alina and Ellis Roven. We are partnered with Vox Media Podcast Network, and our intro outro music was created by Vane Silk.